Hi, my name is Allison Bell. I'm the Executive Director of the Heritage Society. It is my honor and privilege to introduce to you Betty Trapp Chapman, who's been a longtime member of the Heritage Society for since the mid-70s. She's a local historian. She's written at least six books that I know of, and I am always so impressed to learn new things from her. Today, she's going to be talking to us. Her lecture is entitled, A Look at Woman Suffrage, A Century of Struggle. Please welcome Betty Trapp Chapman. August 26, 1920 was a day of joyful, tumultuous tidings for all women in Houston, Texas. When the news reached the state, the city that the state of Tennessee had ratified the 19th Amendment to the United States Constitution. Women were finally full citizens with voting rights. Whistles shrieked and bells rang as carloads of women descended on Main Street at 5.30 p.m. Led by a band assembled by suffragist Florence Sterling, the processional celebrated this long-awaited act of equality. For women, having the vote meant breaking the cord of patriarchy that had existed since ancient times. Even with its theme of life, liberty, and happiness, the revolution did not liberate all Americans. The Civil War did not banish slavery, even though it outlawed the cruel institution of slavery. And the 19th Amendment did not open glass ceilings for women. It might seem as though the right to vote is one of those inalienable rights promised to every citizen by the Declaration of Independence. But our Constitution does not describe voting as a right of citizenship. In fact, the original document did not mention voting at all. It was left to the states to develop their qualifications for voting. At first, most extended the vote to white males, property owners. During the 19th century, some states extended minor suffrage to foreigners, hoping they would encourage settlement in the West where they really needed some people to go and live. A word here about the term suffragist. The word suffrage originally referred to prayers or pleas on behalf of others. The modern definition that evolved in the United States and that we use is the right to vote. The term suffragette is sometimes used mistakenly in referring to American suffragists. British women were seeking voting rights at this very same time. They were frequently militant, even to the point of destroying property. For this reason, Britishers added the suffix to suffragist to belittle the women for being less serious and reputable in their fight. So suffragist remains the proper name for American women. And the movement is known as the woman suffrage movement because it addressed each woman as an individual waging her fight for citizenship. The standard recorded history of the woman suffrage movement has over the years begun with the famous conference preceded by a tea party in Seneca Falls, New York in 1848. Although that is an important event among many others during that century, it was not really the very beginning of woman's trouble to have a, a voice that was heard in this young nation. Our country was settled with the understanding that we were governed by the English common law, which ensured that a woman's legal existence merged into that of her husband. A married woman had no right to own property or keep income, no parental rights over her children, no standing in the law to make contracts or issue petitions of any kind, or especially for divorce. Single women over the ages of 21 and widows, of course, obviously were not subject to these laws but all women were expected to live a life of purity, piety, submission, and domesticity. They were to act as keepers of civic virtue, instilling a quality of democracy in the next generation. This role for women in America's new democracy promoted a surge of interest in female education and public participation for women. Yet women's work left very little time for anything outside the home. In the beginning, women who int expressed interest in politics or the public sphere were rare. An exception to this attitude was Abigail Adams, wife of John Adams, a writer of the Declaration of Independence and a future president, as we know. <laughs> 
17, in 1776, Abigail wrote a letter to John as he headed to the Second Continental Congress in Philadelphia, in which she urged him to remember the ladies, warning that women would cause a rebellion if attention is not paid in, to their interest, and that they would not be bound by any laws in which they have no voice or representation. Abigail also put in a word for educating women when she wrote John. If we mean to have heroes, statesmen, and philosophers, we should have learned women. Educational opportunities for females were really limited in those days. Why would a woman need mathematics or Latin or physics for the lives they led? Education became more available when women like Emma Willard in uh, New York and Mary Lyon in Massachusetts opened female academies, offering rigorous courses for young women. There was even one in Houston by mid-century, Miss Mary B. Brown's School for Young Ladies, that later was advertised as the Vassar of the South. Young black women had fewer opportunities for study, especially in the South. However, when co-educational Oberlin College opened in Ohio in the 1830s, women, both black and white, were offered for the first time an education equal to that of a male. This education would produce suffragists who would lead the way on a long journey ahead. Lucy Stone, a young woman from Boston, had saved money from her meager salary as a teacher to enter Oberlin College at age 25. After graduation, as the first woman in Massachusetts to receive a college degree, she was hired by the Massachusetts Anti-Slavery Society to go out and speak publicly for them and give lectures on abolition. A dynamic speaker, Stone was much in demand. However, she soon infuriated the male members of the society because she added women's rights to her speeches that she was given. But that fury did not stop Lucy Stone, for she had found her voice, as did many women who followed her example and became leaders in the woman's suffrage movement. Lucretia Mott, a Quaker minister, wife, and mother of six, was a Philadelphia abolitionist who was so adamant about ending slavery that she, like other Quakers, refused to import cotton clothing, cane sugar, and slavery-produced goods from the South. By the time the American Anti-Slavery Society was formed in Philadelphia, Mott was already such an accomplished speaker that she was the only woman ever invited to address the proceedings. However, when Mott was not invited to join the society, she joined with black and white women and they formed their own female anti-slavery society, which opposed both slavery and racism. Scores of these societies were formed. Some shunned political activities, while others pushed for reform at state legislative sessions and court hearings. These women, though, were ridiculed as petticoat politicians. After rioters threatened to disrupt a meeting of the Boston Society, the individual societies decided they needed to jointly come together in order to accomplish what they wanted to. So on May 7, 1839, 71 abolitionists from 25 societies in seven states gathered in New York in what is believed to be the first national convention of American women. Attending that convention were the Grimke sisters, Angelina and Sarah. Born into a slave-owning family in South Carolina, the Grimke sisters had fled the South for Philadelphia, where they became passionate speakers against slavery and for women's rights. Angelina Grimke would reply when men would say, oh, you don't need to be out here public speaking. That is not what a lady is supposed to be doing. She would reply, men may settle this and other questions at the ballot box, but we have no such right. It is only through petitions that we can reach the legislature. And even after suffer collecting thousands of names on petitions, we are never heard. The female movement for equal rights had emphatically begun. The presence in London of seven American women in the first world anti-slavery convention in 1840 would further their desire to have representation in the abolitionist organizations. To the women's dismay, 
they were removed from the floor, seated upstairs with no right to speak, while the male representatives, including their husbands, of course, remained in the voting body. Two women from the group, Lucretia Mott and Elizabeth Cady Stanton, would answer what they perceived as real discrimination in their treatment, but it would take eight years before that occurred. During these years, some regional conventions were held to consider educational, property, and marital reforms for women, but to consider voting was still very, very controversial. In 1848, Mott, the Quaker minister, and young Stanton, a wife and mother of three, called for a conference to be held at a Methodist chapel in Seneca Falls, New York. A Declaration of Sentiments, which was patterned after the Declaration of Independence, uh, was presented to the 300 persons in attendance. It listed a litany of grievances against men who had deprived women of their right to own property, to claim their own wages, to pursue an education, to sue for divorce, serve on juries, and cast ballots as a full citizen. Although this was a call to action, it would take time for them to transform it into reality. They likely never dreamed it would take seven decades to achieve this. In 1850, these newly proclaimed suffragists held their first National Women's Rights Convention in Worcester, Massachusetts, with delegates from the Northeast and Midwest. Conventions would become a staple of women's rights work, women's rights work and they helped to propel its growth. During these years, Elizabeth Cady Stanton was the intellectual writer, Lucy Stone, the gifted orator, and Susan B. Anthony, the chief organizer. The outbreak of the Civil War in 1861 caused most suffrage activities to cease because the women were into the war effort. Uh, they would take over work on the farms, in the stores, nursing the wounded, raising money, and even disguising as soldiers to serve as spies. The war actually served as a training ground for these women because they would learn organizational and occupational skills that they then would be able to use in their suffrage movement. After the war, Congress passed two amendments to the Constitution. The 14th Amendment defined national citizenship and declared that former slave states could not deny voting rights to any male citizen. This was the first time the word male appeared in the Constitution. The 15th Amendment declared that voting rights could not be denied on account of race and therefore enfranchised black males. The suffragists, having spoken out for universal suffrage, expected to be included in the 15th Amendment. And when they were not, they were very unhappy. They were furious that the word sex was not included with race. In this moment, they realized that they needed to campaign in the true sense of the word, that holding conventions and speaking out was not going to push their movement forward. Through the American Equal Rights Association, which had been formed after the Seneca Falls Conference, women enlarged their public speaking stage to agitate at both the state and the local levels. As this agreement grew among the members, a decision was made in 1869 to form two separate national organizations. Elizabeth Cady Stanton was joined by Susan B. Anthony in organizing the National Woman Suffrage Association. Anthony, a, re a resident of Rochester, New York, had become a reformer after discovering that she was not being paid the same uh, salary in the school where she taught as were the males, and she was absolutely infuriated by that because she was doing equal work. Stanton and Anthony proposed that literacy should be a test in acquiring the vote, and together the two women launched a campaign in New York to petition for a suffrage amendment to the New York Constitution. When that campaign failed, they fearlessly planned another one. This would be the beginning of decades of public meetings and petitions. At the same time, Lucy Stone, the young abolitionist from earlier years, and her husband, Henry Blackwell, Lucy had done the unthinkable and had kept her maiden name when she married, 
Joined with Judy Ward Howe, the revered author of the Battle Hymn of the Republic, informing the American Woman Suffrage Association headquartered in Boston with members from 21 states. It would campaign for advancing women's rights as well as those of the recently enfranchised black males. The American Woman Suffrage Association began publishing the Woman's Journal, which would be the real voice for suffrage for the next 50 years. It was edited by Howe and then later by Alice Stone Blackwell, Henry and Lucy's daughter. The suffragists became bolder in their battle for equality. In the 1872 presidential election, Susan B. Anthony decided she was going to go vote. So she went down to the courthouse and was going to test them. Instead, she was arrested. She was denied a jury by trial and fined $100 which she never paid. But at this same time, Sojourner Truth, a former slave and early abolitionist, appeared at a polling booth in Grand Rapids, Michigan, and was turned away. By this time, Sojourner Truth, whose birth name was Isabel Bomfrey, had been preaching as a courageous advocate for equality and an eloquent defender of human rights for 30 years. The first public protest for suffrage occurred in Philadelphia in 1876 during the nation's centennial celebration when a group of suffragists interrupted the proceedings to present an updated copy of their Declaration of Sentiments. Over the next two years, women from all over the country wrote in and asked if their name could be added to this. In 1878, a woman's suffrage amendment was introduced to the United States Congress and it read, The right of citizens of the United States to vote shall not be denied or abridged by the United States or by any state on account of sex. It will languish there for 41 years. The 1880s were sometimes called the doldrum years because little advancement was made in the cause. The existence of two national organizations divided the suffragists. The National Woman Suffrage Association favored working for the federal amendment, while the American Woman Suffrage Association was working toward getting state uh, constitution amendments followed. The western states would be the most fertile place to plant any kind of, of real uh, passage of law, but by 1890, only one state, Wyoming, had passed any suffrage for women. And they had been this, how many years had they been working on this? Uh, these were also the years when anti-suffrage opposition became very, very strong. Males had long held feelings against women casting votes, although there were male supporters in many areas. The liquor lobby was an expected uh, opponent of the suffrage movement, particularly after the Women's Christian Temperance Union had endorsed them. And in addition to the distillers and brewers who worked largely behind the scenes, the antis also drew support from urban political machines, corporate capitalists, and southern congressmen as the suffrage movement moved southward in the 20th century. However, it was the female opponents who became the most organized and the most vocal. Soon there were anti-suffrage groups from Kansas to Vermont. In the face of this growing opposition, the two national groups decided to merge and form the National American Woman Suffrage Association, which agreed to direct all of their efforts towards securing state amendments. With this merger, the membership was made up of radical feminists, progressives, society women, moderates, and states' rights Southerners. But unlike the early abolitionists who worked together across racial lines, the National Association Woman uh, Suffrage Association was becoming heavily segregated as more white suffrage groups were being recruited in the South, where restrictions on voting from poll taxes to literacy tests were being introduced to keep African Americans from the polls. The gulf between white women and women of color widened even more in all suffrage matters. In 1896, several black women's groups came together in Washington, D.C. and formed the National Association of Colored Women. Among its founders were Mary Church Terrell, 
who had been educated at Oberlin and was a Washington, D.C. educator, Ida B. Wells, the very prominent journalist, Margaret Murray Washington, who was also an educator, and Harriet Tubman, whom we remember from her work with the Underground Railroad. Terrell was elected as the first president and a motto, lifting as we climb, was adopted. The coalition quickly grew in influence and encouraged thousands of members to organize support equally for suffrage, temperance, and other civic reforms. The National American Woman Suffrage Association shifted its attention to the South, where no states had been organized at all. And this had been many, many years that the movement had been in effect. Texas was one of the states that answered the call to organize. The Texas Equal Rights Association was formed in 1893, and within a year, local organizations had been formed in eight, eight towns across the state. But opposition immediately surfaced, especially among Texas males, who argued that suffrage would break up the home and destroy chivalry. Moreover, it violated biblical teachings. Women were already adequately represented by men, and women could not defend the country by serving in the armed forces. Therefore, they should not have all of the privileges of citizenship. When women were polled about this, they were equally divided. These anti-suffragists loudly proclaimed that those other women would become a set of reigning politicians to the detriment of protecting the home. After two years, the Texas Equal Rights Association ceased to function. Almost a decade will pass before any suffrage activity reappears in Texas, and it will occur in Houston. In February 1903, sisters Catherine, Annette, and Elizabeth Finnegan sent an invitation to women in Houston to form a suffrage group in, in the city. Annette was an 1894 Wellesley College graduate, and she had become involved with the suffrage movement when she had lived in New York City after graduating from Wellesley. Within just a few months, the group boasted a membership of 73, had invited the national president, Carrie Chapman Catt, to come and speak in Houston at City Auditorium. The women then decided to initiate a state organization. Annette Finnegan, as president, traveled much of southeast Texas and beyond, trying to find other towns that would like to join and be a part of the state association. The only two she found, other than Houston, were Galveston and Laporte. So that was not going to create a very strong statewide association. Annette Finnegan would later remark that the women were just too timid to organize. It is still a controversial subject, particularly in, in the South. Uh, the suffragists, though, during that time did unsuccessfully campaign to have a woman named to the Houston School Board, and they would meet monthly and study bills that were under consideration in the state legislature that regarded juvenile courts, divorce laws, compulsory education, property rights of married women, and most importantly, women's right to vote as taxpayers. When the Finnegans returned to New York in 1905, the club ceased to meet. After all, the President of the United States, Grover Cleveland, had recently issued this statement, sensible and responsible women do not want to vote. However, the State Association remained an inactive organization and will be brought back to life in 1913 along with the local group. Just as it seemed the suffrage movement was finding it more difficult to move the passage of voting rights forward, another women's movement accelerated in growth across the country. The formation of clubs in which women banded together to acquire knowledge through study with other women. Many, no doubt, were experiencing the education they had been denied. In 1889, members from uh, groups all across the country formed the General Federation of Women's Clubs. This was not a suffrage group. Indeed, the Federation did not even endorse suffrage until 1914, but they were considered, uh, they were really concerned about things that were not being done uh, in the country, particularly in education, health, and social service kinds of things. 
So they realized, though, that their voices were not adequate in creating change. They needed to act, and such action would take them out of their separate sphere into a broad new world. In Houston, clubs were formed uh, so that they could become these instruments of change. The city had no public library. The women had incessantly for years really badgered the city fathers about this. And finally, they convinced them that if they raised the money for land, uh, they would find a donor to build the building, which they did. And then when the library opened, they became the first volunteers for it. In a similar manner, women came together to teaching art in the public schools. And then they realized, you know, art is a citywide thing. We don't need to limit it just to children. So they expanded their programming. The result, the first municipal art museum in Texas. Uh, in 1900, a group of women really flouted convention and marched on City Hall, because normally women didn't go over to the mayor's office, and said, we have no parkland in Houston. We need a park. So, in 1900, uh, the result was City Park, now Sam Houston Park, that contains the restored 1847 Park Headquarters building, is the oldest building on its original site in the city of Houston, and one that is known today as the Kellum Noble House and is administered by the Heritage Society. In its early days, Houston was often criticized for being not real clean and maybe not attractive. So a group of women formed the Civic Club so they could address these kinds of needs. And they were able to have some ordinances passed, one being that for the first time, everybody was required to have lids on their garbage cans because that was a sanitation and a health problem. A civic club was then organized in each ward in the city, and they began doing that in each ward. Another thing they did was trying to find parkland in each ward uh, for, to establish a city park, and we have some of those with us today, too. Another group of women started the Houston Settlement Association, which addressed public health and educational needs by opening settlement houses in neighborhoods that were in need of social services. In addressing local issues, women discovered they were able to publicize poor working conditions in local stores, especially those employing women. As a result of their demands, storekeepers adjusted their clerks' daily work hours, agreed to provide seats for them when they had a break where they could rest. Matrons were placed in both the jails and the railroad stations for the protection of women. Through the State Federation, these determined women lobbied successfully for legislation regarding a state child welfare commission, tougher child labor laws, a juvenile court system, public kindergartens, compulsory school attendance, pure food inspection, and a state library commission. But they were not of course, doing it through having voting privileges, they just had to lobby and speak out and try to have these things acquired. So most of the, these women were not really in suffrage organizations at that time because it was still pretty con controversial. But they knew that the key to everything was ensuring permanent reform, and that meant having a vote. The women were making progress in helping to create a more livable city and others in the city were beginning to wonder, perhaps they do deserve to have a vote. In 1913, the Texas Woman's Suffrage Association was revived under the leadership of Eleanor Brackenridge of San Antonio. The Houston Club experienced growing support for their cause, but it also met with a lot of ridicule. A men's social group decided they would have what they called a suffragette, again, an uncomplimentary use of the word, parade down Main Street, and so they dressed up like women and paraded down really making fun. Uh, and the, you know, the suffragists felt like that was casting doubt on their validity, but they said nothing. And just a few months earlier, they had marched in a parade with thousands of other suffragists in Washington, D.C., under the banner of Texas. 
and marching became a popular means of raising their demands for a right to vote. And you will begin to see marches occurring all over the country of these suffragists uh, saying, we need the vote. We should have the, the vote. In 1914, Annette Finnegan was again elected president of the state organization, which had its headquarters in the Hotel Brazos here in Houston. Finnegan led the way in defining the suffragist as a polit suffrage as a political issue, just as she had experienced the struggle in New York City. They realized they needed to shift their tactics from earnest but sometimes tentative pleas to taking more aggressive action. So Annette Finnegan sends a letter to every legislator asking if they would uh, favor uh, women having the vote, uh, and would they submit a, a constitutional amendment to that effect. She recorded their answers, which I have seen written in the Austin History Center in her own handwriting, and they were like, no, I do not believe that, that God intended for woman to have control of man, or politics are too bad for a lady to vote in, uh, to mix in. And of course, so they didn't get anything accomplished right then. Then a group of them went to Austin and spent a, a long length of time personally lobbying these legislators, of course, who were all, all males. And then back home, they began uh, going around to business leaders and trying to get their support. They wrote letters. They gave speeches. They began holding outdoor rallies in parks and inviting the public to come hear their, their talks and their plea. Well, by then they weren't really pleased. They were getting a, a lot more uh, dominant in what they were doing. They held schools to train suffrage workers so they would know how to go out and ask for the vote. Uh, they spread out across the state in an attempt to form more local clubs and by 1916, there were 81 clubs in the Texas Equal Suffrage Association. There was no official state organization in Texas for black suffragists. A few local organizations existed across the state, including one in Galveston. But most of the black women suffra suffragists worked through their clubs, through their churches, and then eventually did some work you know, together. They would come together in the city. The Heritage Society's next lecture on suffrage on September 17th will focus on Harris County's black females and the incredible story of their participation in the 1920 election, information which has just very recently been compiled. Progress toward achieving legal rights for women was moving at a snail's pace in the South and Texas was no exception. And it would be interrupted by the country's entrance into World War I in April 1917. With the advent of the war, the suffragists put their activities aside and said, no, we're, we're going to join in the war effort. This is, this is something that we all need to be involved in. They rolled bandages, planted victory gardens, gathered supplies for the Red Cross, and supported the soldiers stationed at Houston's Camp Logan. Women in the city canvassed for the Liberty Loans, selling $890,000 in bonds, uh, that is today $15 million in currency, and the Houston Equal Suffrage Association alone raised one-third of that amount. As they were praised for their patriotic service, the suffragists reminded the electorate that patriotism and responsibility are inseparable. They wanted the responsibility associated with voting rights. And lest we forget, Texas was in the middle of a pandemic in 1918 with an estimated 2,100 Texans died in the Spanish flu uh, epidemic. That was more than one third of the total deaths suffered during in Tex by Texans in all of, of World War one in the war itself. In spite of difficult times, these persistent women stayed the course. Although su suffrage leaders realized that a state constitutional amendment was no closer to reality after another defeat in the legislature, they developed a plan that they thought might really work. 
Following the impeachment of Governor Ferguson, a strong anti-suffragist, the state organization under the leadership of Minnie Fisher Cunningham decided to push for primary suffrage with the support of Governor William P. Hobby. The bill passed and became law on March 26, 1918. In just 17 days before the July 27th upcoming primary election, 386,000 women in Texas registered to vote. The first woman to register in Harris County was Hortense Ward, the president of the Houston Equal Suffrage Association and the city's first female attorney. Women were slowly but surely becoming a force on the political stage. In June 1919, Congress finally passed the 19th Amendment, sending it to the states for ratification. Texas moved quickly. We were the ninth to, to ratify it overall and the first state in the South to ratify. So why did it take so long for women to acquire the vote and to have their voices heard? The long-held precept that women, womanhood existed in a separate sphere was very slow to ever fail or diminish. It continued for so long to be focused on being pious, pure, submissive, and domestic, and certainly not out in the public wanting to do anything in the political range. Therefore, women were just not considered rough or tough enough in the tumble world of politics. There was also the racial divide between the white women and women of color. Each had their own organizations, which prevented any cooperative efforts in reaching the finishing line. And finally, conservative sectionalism existed in the country, especially in the South. While all of these concerns slowed the process of enlarging woman's sphere beyond the home and church, three generations of females were valiantly persistent in demanding that their voice be heard. Today, women can express this gratitude to those who paved the way for us by marching to the polls and never failing to cast a ballot in an election, every election, large or small. It is a privilege and a responsibility and let's not ever forget that are the women who fought for that right. Thank you, Betty, for that fabulous talk. I always learn something new when I listen to Betty. Um, stay tuned now for our question and answer session. Thank you for joining us.